Good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many of you again. Um, so yes, my talk is going to be on technical scoping like a pro to build the right thing and be a superhero. Uh, I really liked it when I came up with the title. It nicely rhymes. Um, I'm a solutions architect at Cyberduck. Um, and prior to this, I've mostly been a, a developer over the last couple of years. And I'll be sharing with you some of the, the learnings that have come from working on multiple different projects where they have not got the element of technical scoping done right. And then you end up having all of that pain and suffering as a developer or on the tech side. Um, so hopefully this will help to address that. So yeah, over the last uh, few years, I've moved um, roles. The technology is obviously heckling me today. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Yeah, I guess all the people using Linux out there are probably smiling to themselves quite smugly. So in terms of the audience here, could you raise your hands if you're a developer? And maybe it's easier if you raise your hands if you're not a developer. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay, so my talk today, I'll be uh, sharing some of those experiences on working on lots of uh, web development projects where things haven't been scoped properly um, and sharing some of the things I wish I knew at the beginning of that journey to hopefully help um, address it. And some of this will include technical analysis, working closely with UX and UI designers, project managers, and clients to hopefully um, deliver successful technical projects. And then from that technical analysis, um, yeah, be a superhero, basically. So a quick intro. Um, I may stand here. It may be my magnetic personality interfering with the laptop over there. So yes, uh, w w one of the themes I'll be covering is happiness during this. And this little guy makes me smile um, and happy every day. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I've been a freelance Drupal developer for most of my professional career. And most recently, I've found a home at Cyberduck. Um, so I've been there 10 months so far which is the longest I've ever been in any company so far. Hopefully it'll be a lot longer. And uh, Aiden is on the left, then it's Amira, then it's Akira. So Aiden's the Celtic name and Amira is uh, the Arabic name and Akira is the Japanese name. So we're already doing the um, Punjabi Hungarian thing. So diversity is always important in tech as well. Um, so yeah. Um, some of the projects I've worked on in the past, so they varied from education to National Grid and lots of different organizations around charities. So some of these experiences are from that wider spectrum and hopefully they'll help you as well. Um, who are Cyberduck? We're a digital agency focused on digital transformation. Um, a lot of the work we do is centered around user experience and accessibility. So that focus is there before a lot of the development work. Um, we've got staff in seven countries. Um, that's, that's me over there. And uh, yeah, we've got some people in Spain and Portugal and Malta, and we do um, a lot of remote working as well. Um, and the technologies we focus on are within PHP, Drupal, and Laravel. So 
So I mentioned earlier that happiness is a recurring theme here, and obviously, you know, to um, if you haven't got the happiness, then it's it's difficult to avoid the stresses, and it can keep the quality of everything really good. So um, happy people, process, and performance is what I'm going to touch on lightly before delving into the technical scoping aspects. So, yeah, um, great places to work simply perform better. Um, you can see there's a much higher percentage of uh, cumulative returns um, in the 100 happiest places to work. And also, um, happy employees are 13% more productive according to Said Business School um, and also happier workers use the time they have more effectively increasing the pace without sacrificing quality and doing extra hours. Conversely unhappy people don't follow processes and especially when they're treated in an uncivil way 38% of employees said that they intentionally decrease the quality of their work. So as you see, happiness is quite important. Um, and then beyond uh, covering the basics, if you're happy, you're more likely to also come up with innovative ideas and improve the processes. And I think especially on, on technical projects where you have multiple different disciplinary teams, it's quite important to work collaboratively, but obviously tools are only one aspect of that and coming up with ideas on improving that process or um, learning from any of those failures is quite important as well. <clears throat> and if you have freedom and autonomy, it can bring value to clients. So here's a, uh, a quote from a senior UX designer at Cyberduck. So the principles of performance and people and process. Um, having these principles clear in your organization can be quite important as well. Um, so obviously there's an aspect around uh, documenting those processes and making sure you stick to them, but also um, empowering your team to deliver as much value as possible. Um, one thing that can work quite well is moving people around teams as well. So if you've got a technical person putting them in new business, or if you've got somebody in um, the design team, having them work closely with um, account management and different things like that. But yeah, sharing knowledge also. Um, and here is some bits about culture. So it's a successful partnership um, where you're bringing lots of different teams together to take care of your technical scoping. And it, it, uh, it starts with um, making sure you've got a smooth handover from the new business or the salespeople over to account management and also project management. Um, and that will include understanding the client, the project, the team, and their expectations. Um, it's very important to if you've got a project that starts with, after selling it, you've got UX design and um, UI design, you want to have the tech lead involved at the early stages of that so that they can help shape the outputs from the UX team in terms of wireframes um, and other things like that. But also it allows you to tweak and keep things in scope and therefore budget. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the quick intro. And now on the uh, topic of technical scoping. So yeah, every uh, new development project should start with a requirement spec or a scoping phase. 
There are situations where you may already have this, but it can be quite light. Um, understanding the underlying business needs and defining how that's going to translate in software to address those needs in the best way. Um, and for commercial undertakings, um, starting at the new business stage with a very well written brief um, from the client is quite important as well. In some situations, that brief might be um, you know, a page or two, or there are aspects in the brief around um, API integrations or CRM integrations that are very woolly or very flaky, um, and getting more of that information up front will then help to um, get your scope sorted and then make sure the right allocated budget is there as well. Um, and yeah, if the uh, client's brief isn't great, working with them by having as many questions early will ho hopefully help to improve that brief before it's then passed on in the process. But al also with your internal teams, the same can be true with internal stakeholders, just making sure as much of the information is as clear as possible at the beginning will then save you lots of time and effort and hopefully get you um, reducing the number of bugs you've got later and other things along those lines. And one of the ways you can help with that process to improve the briefs is by maybe having a short discovery phase as well. So yeah, uh, good scoping is a fine art and it's one that needs to be approached with due care and attention. After all, it is the starting point for any project. And if you don't do it properly, it can have uh, devastating effects later in the project, such as overworking, being tired, um, having to pull all-nighters sometimes. Uh, definitely, we've all been there, right? And uh, it also has the impact on other things like timings and costs, and then back to the happiness thing. Your client's not going to be happy. Your project managers aren't going to be happy. Everybody's going to be unhappy. They're not going to be performing. And you're probably not going to be having a very successful project. Ultimately, though, it's not only... Um, I think that there are many situations where a lot of this stress is put on the shoulders of techies. It's like, you know, you've got this brief. Um, there's a lot of responsibility. And in some cases, you've got project managers who are saying, Here, here's the brief, sort it out, you know, deliver it. And they kind of expect you to figure out all the stuff and make up for the lack of the scope that's already been done. Uh, your team may benefit from having business analysts. Um, if your team doesn't have a business analyst, there are cases where you as a tech lead, you will end up taking on the tech lead role, a tech PM role, a business analyst role. So, and, and it's much harder to negotiate those things when a project's already moving. It's generally a bit easier to do that early on in the project. Um, and if you, if you don't have all of those internal stakeholders, there are conversations that you can have around saying, okay, we've got all these projects, maybe we need a business analyst, maybe we need a dedicated product owner that has knowledge of user stories, things like that can be helpful. So the, the high level steps around technical scoping that I found useful on some of the projects I've worked on um, include uh, key steps for every scoping phase should include clarifying project parameters. These are set out in detail uh, on what the problem is and how the project will actually go about addressing that. Um, ideally, you would be detailing all of the individual tasks there and subtasks. Um, there are pros and cons of, you know, working. So, so obviously, working in an agile way and work, working in a waterfall way are going to have differences. But as much of this as you can at the beginning will be helpful. Um, especially if you are working in an agile way and the client you're working for um, is a very waterfall client. They're going to need as much of this in high-level requirement documents and things like that to begin with. Um, also, allocating responsibilities of who's going to be taking care of what. So who's going to be doing the penetration testing, who's going to be doing the, um, the user acceptance testing, when they're going to be available, who's going to be handling the content, and, and just working all of that into the plan. Um, and then also you've got the estimating of your uh, timeframes. There are some cases I've worked on projects where the CEO of the company has already said publicly um, that a project will be delivered in May. And you know by the time it then gets sold and UX and tech people look at it, 
you're somehow delivering an eight-month project in three months or four months. And ideally, it's obviously a cultural change. You know, those business people ideally would have had the conversations with tech earlier. But hopefully, we can all address that problem as a wider collective and start pushing back as well to hopefully make that change. And then um, setting milestones, where you can be linking your key tasks and timings and your responsibility holders to build a timeline so that you can refer back to it at key points. Um, and in, in many cases, the milestones, if, if you don't have enough milestones during your project, um, it can cause uh, situations where you might run out of budget early, like so cash flow and things like that. It's generally good to have milestones maybe every month or so to keep things kind of moving. Obviously, it depends on very specifics on your project. Um, and that obviously, this also helps you to allocate finance for, for the work you've done to estimate project costs. So here we've got a, um, an example of a uh, UX workshop for a project we did for the Commonwealth. But you can see it's, it's going through post-it notes and organizing those. Um, and it's, it's one way to kind of early on involve a lot of your key stakeholders on the client side so that they're involved in the process. So not only you get the requirements of what you need to build, but also by involving them early, um, you benefit from not having that bit where clients are seeing things when they're in the UAT phase uh, for user acceptance testing. Um, and it, it brings everyone on on that same unified single team journey as well. But yeah, these, these high level steps will hopefully um, help you to cover the basics of the scoping phase. But in our experience, they're just the starting point of that conversation. And if you want to make a project truly successful, uh, scoping also needs three other factors. And the first factor is allocating a key project owner. And there are many projects I've worked on where there's no clear project owner. You have design by committee, you have three or four people all on director level on a client side, and they're all equally as important. And depending on what one person's saying, you have to change you know, the scope. So there could be situations where your marketing and comms manager on the client side likes these particular colors, but they haven't necessarily been thought through on. Um, and then you've got your commercial directors that'll be you know, pulling you in another direction. So by having a single unified uh, project owner that's been identified, ideally having them make all the key decisions and take care of all the other communications with everyone else can be quite, quite useful. Um, and sometimes you don't see the value of that until that UAT phase or later on in the project. But obviously, if it's been identified early and you've done things like identify the milestones, then based on the milestones and the key sign-off points, you can pre-book all the um, calendar availability of all the key stakeholders as well. So yeah, one of these things will be identifying which of the features are really important so you can build up your MVP. Um, and yes, like I said, uh, the, number of key uh, the number of different stakeholders with different priorities is a challenge. And you know, in, in the worst projects, that can lead to scope creep um, and disagreements on what you've delivered versus what should be delivered. And yeah, it gets really messy. And, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where people are bringing up the original contract says this and those conversations can get quite hairy. And then project managers are asking the developers to work on the weekend or something along those lines to, to help rescue a project. But also, it's quite important to do, um, consider this internally, but also if you're bringing in outside contractors, because they're going to need access to your team for everything from discovery to user acceptance testing. And if you build it in from the beginning, it's always easier. Similar to accessibility, you want to consider that at the beginning. Um, it's hard to kind of drop it in later. The, the second of these points is building in a discovery phase. Uh, the most important thing is there's uh, sufficient thought around the front of the project, around the parameters, while also leaving the flexibility to work out some of the key details later on. It's also worth spending uh, your time talking to end users um, directly to the end users. There are many projects where you work with a client and they will say, we understand our users. We know what they want. 
And that can be quite a challenging situation where it's ideal to push back um, and suggest that um, the user experience team or, or even the tech, tech people or project managers will ideally be leapfrogging that uh, in between phase and speaking directly to users, but identifying the right users to figure out your personas and things like that so that you've got all the, the wide voices, but it's been done in a, in a structured way as well. Um, and allocating time and resource to this internally um, is, is key because it's hard to get people's availability during um, tight projects, but also when they're very busy with lots of active streams around back end and front end and API integrations, it can get quite tricky as well. Um, and there are cases where you might want to get outside experts um, to help you and give you a fresh perspective. So there could be service designers, there could be UX designers, UX researchers, you know, and that might be helpful for you as a, to hire someone as a freelancer or have someone embedded in your team. And maybe by doing a uh, needs analysis early in the project of what kind of skills you need, it helps you to identify where those gaps are. And if it's a six month project and you identify in month one, we're gonna need this person it could be the recruitment process takes two months and you've got them all, all lined up and ready to go um, seamlessly so that you can take that holiday in two months' time. Sometimes much needed. And then uh, the third of those is building in the flexibility. So it's natural to want to know all the details up front. It's not always possible. Um, and it's important to be flexible. And no matter how much planning you do at the beginning, Ultimately, as you start working on things, you may come up with other ideas or in the, in the situation of COVID, right? Many things changed and people had to adapt their businesses. So be, being as flexible as possible would be handy. Um, and sometimes you'll unexpectedly hit on ways of doing things that make things better, but also working in an agile way that's flexible would be ideal. Um, you can work it with a Moscow rating system, which is must, must have, should have, um, and want, something very similar to that. But it allows you to classify your tasks as the things that are really important to get those delivered first. So this can be handy with uh, more waterfall-based uh, clients where you want to maybe identify the, the top 30 things out of their wish list, the 50 that need to be uh, delivered. Yeah, and it, and it stops things falling off the bottom of the pile. And although scoping has functional steps, it's also the mindset which is carried out, which um, it's the mindset with which it's carried out that's gonna have the greatest impact of success. Obviously, each project is different and using these tools in your arsenal at the right time can be handy as well in different situations. And with a rigorous discovery phase, and the right people, and technical input, and uh, commitment to flexibility, you're much more likely to achieve results that are, are great and people be praising you and maybe get promoted and be a superhero as well. So yeah, obviously none of this would be possible if uh, you were to treat technology as a silo. Um, and although there are imbalances on how much responsibility of the success of a project is put on a development team. Um, a successful partnership brings lots of additional benefits like um, building your product that's ultimately of higher quality that factors in things like how people think, um, accessibility, um, conversion rate optimization, all of those different factors that different teams can bring. And it could be you've got uh, people in marketing looking at your Google Analytics it could be you've got situations where, um, yeah, so, so from, from looking at those Google Analytics results, you might be able to identify what are the key pages, the top 10 pages that need to be considered from a user experience perspective, but also they won't tell you the whole picture because that will only tell you what's successful based on now, based on what's ranking on uh, search engines and things like that. Partnering with uh, UX design and research helps you to uncover some of those additional aspects as well. And if it's not something that you currently have in your organization, I would encourage you to try to find ways to incorporate it because um, it's really handy. 
So yeah, by, by doing a UX discovery, so this could be right at the beginning of the project, the ideal situation would be there would be budget and a team identified that you would start your UX discovery before doing the rest of it. And then if, before even getting to UI design, before getting to development. And if you're able to allow the UX team to really run that process, uh, you can have many other benefits of really finding out, like I said, you know, what, what users' needs are, personas, what needs to be built, make sure it's all taking all those wider considerations in. Um, because ultimately, we can't do it all alone. Um, and you need help from UX superheroes too. And if there are cases where your organization might say they don't have the budget for this, I think there are still situations where people see this is a cost, that's a cost. If, if there's a way of reframing that conversation around it's an investment and ultimately you'll have a higher quality product, um, it, it can justify itself. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Sandeep. We'll really do uh, a short Q&A now. Yes. Any questions? You can probably tell I was a little bit nervous during part of that. I've done this before. I don't know what it is. Two years of no practice, and that's it. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering how you, so you've obviously got your process where you've got the sales team who kind of make the sale and then you go into all the project scoping. Mm -hmm. How do you then, presumably sometimes you go into the project scoping and then whatever was sold, you, know, you kind of have to I don't know, go back and say actually it's going to be three times the cost we thought it was. Um, just kind of, yeah, how do you handle that sort of, um, yeah, that sort of change in scope from doing the really good discovery afterwards? Yeah, so the first thing I'd suggest is trying to put things in place so that doesn't happen. Um, and I guess there are situations, so, so the, the first thing that would help there, I guess, would be trying to make sure that the new business team has people with development experience in it. That's not always possible. Um, if that's not possible, trying to find ways of collaborating with them closely to get them to understand what they're really selling. So like, you're buying, you know, get to know the in intricacies of CMS and all of those aspects and ask the right questions as well along the way. Um, ideally having tech lead and CTO involvement in those new business inquiries with, with um, clients before proposals are sent. But if for any reason, no matter how much attention you put into that process, there are discrepancies. There are situations of maybe selling uh, an additional statement of work. So I've been on a project where I was tech leading it and what the original assumption was, copy and paste this code base that another agency's made, make some changes to it, it's gonna be really easy, it's gonna be minimal work. And in that particular project, there was the ex-CTO who thought they understood the system, was involved in the process, but um, had underestimated that actually the front end was built in a very different way, and the user experience of the CMS was using the old way of doing things rather than an intuitive way. So in that particular situation, I raised the conversation early with the client on a weekly account management, project management catch up, um, and basically said, look, we can give you this, what, uh, we, can, we can give you this, but if we quickly, if you allow us to demo this other experience, you'll then get an understanding. Um, so you're not necessarily, you're, you're giving options and you're explaining those options and you're making them as easy to understand as possible. And in that particular situation, I think I was able to sell a statement of work of maybe another 20 days or so to do like seven days back end, a couple of days front end, some QA testing, project management and account management time. And that was totally fine because they saw that that helped with the quality on that. So I think that's probably the best way, or at least in my experience. Um, and you may realize you've got, like if you've got a very complex project consolidation phase, um, there can actually be more work in the statements of work than the original large stream of work as well. So there can be cases where you've got an SOW for some content, some um, pen testing for usability testing, loads of different bits really. Thanks. Anyone else? 
is really quiet often when it comes to user experience, isn't it? People neglect it too often. Uh, everyone's, wait, everyone's waiting for lunch. 